Hello, my name is Leon Menezes. I'm a consultant radiologist and a nuclear medicine physician at the Institute of Nuclear Medicine at UCL and here in the Bart's Heart Centre. This series of talks from the British Nuclear Cardiology Society we've recorded is to give you the basic grounding in nuclear cardiology, the applications, the technology and the evidence. We hope you find them interesting and useful. This talk will cover the principles of SPECT and PET imaging for cardiology. My name is Catherine. I am one of the medical physicists that works in nuclear medicine at University College Hospital. So in this talk, we will cover a brief introduction to radioactivity. Um, we'll go, then go on to talk about the gamma camera that we use to detect it and how that works. Um, then go on to uh, planar imaging and MUGA scans followed by the principles of 3D SPECT imaging and myocardial perfusion imaging. Um, we'll then talk briefly about semiconductor detectors, uh, followed by uh, positron emission tomography or PET imaging, and finally we'll finish off by going through some hybrid imaging. Okay, so let's start with an introduction to radioactivity. So atoms contain a nucleus which is made up of both protons and neutrons, and these are then orbited by electrons. Isotopes are defined as atoms with the same number of protons and electrons, but different numbers of neutrons. And when isotopes are unstable, they emit energy in the form of radiation. So there are three main types of radiation or radioactive decay, um, which will depend on the isotope. So al there's alpha radiation, which is essentially a helium nucleus. There's beta radiation, which comes in two different forms. You can have either beta minus in the form of an electron or beta plus, which is a positron. Um, and finally, there's gamma radiation as well, which is a photon. And in nuclear medicine imaging, the main thing we're interested in detecting is gamma radiation. In nuclear medicine, we inject a patient with a radiopharmaceutical or radiotracer. The radiopharmaceutical part allows us to target a certain biological process um, and the radioactive component allows us to detect the gamma rays which are emitted and build up a picture of where that tracer has gone in the body. So once the patient has been injected with the radiopharmaceutical, gamma rays are being emitted in all directions from their body and we need to scan them in order to create the images of the biodistribution of the radio tracer. So to detect the emitted gamma rays and to create the images, we use a gamma camera. And I'm going to go through how one of those works now. So in this picture, you can see the components of a gamma camera. At the bottom, you have your patient who is emitting your gamma rays. And each of the gamma rays will then first come into contact with the collimator, which is the first part of the ga gamma camera. We'll then go into the scintillation crystal the photomultiplier tubes, and then finally the processing electronics to create the image. So I'll go through each of those components in turn now. Gamma rays are emitted in all directions from the patient, and the collimators are designed to determine the origin of these photons. So you can see from the picture on the right that a photon that comes in straight into the gamma camera will go straight through into the yellow scintillator crystal, whereas the photon that goes comes in at an angle is attenuated by the collimator, which is made of lead. And you can see what the collimator looks like in three dimensions in that picture in the bottom left. So the collimator, because it does attenuate some of the photons, it will reduce the sensitivity of the detector system. So when you're choosing collimators, it's always a trade-off between spatial resolution and sensitivity. Collimators come in a variety of different designs, depending on the type of imaging that you want to perform. So I was talking before about parallel hole collimators so as the um, design of the collimator shown here on the right where if you have any of the incident gamma rays coming in at an angle they will be attenuated and only those photons which are traveling straight through to the detector will go through to the scintillator but you can also have pinhole collimators shown on the bottom right here so instead of having a series of straight uh, lead scepter you instead have this v shape of lead um, and if your source is at the bottom there, um, the photons will be able to travel through at an angle and you'll end up with an inverted and magnified image at the end. Um, so that's generally used for imaging small objects, for instance the thyroid. Um, 
when designing the collimator you can also adjust the hole length and width for parallel hole collimators so the longer the lead scepter are of the collimator and the closer they are together the higher the spatial resolution you will have in the image um, because you're only allowing a smaller ang angle of incidence of the incoming gamma rays to come through to the scintillator crystal. Um, you can also increase the thickness of the scepter and that is usually done to um, absorb higher energy photons. So you choose the collimator to suit the kind of scan that you're doing. Generally in nuclear medicine we use low energy collimators for cardiac scans because we're using technetium 99M which is a low energy gamma ray emitter. So the collimators we would use would start with LE for low energy and then they could either be high resolution HR or general purpose GP. So the next part of the gamma camera is the scintillation crystal. So this converts the incoming ionizing radiation into light photons. Um, using a scintillator. So generally in nuclear medicine we use a sodium iodide crystal doped with thallium and it works by de-exciting electrons in the scintillator during a high energy state to a ground energy state which leads to the production of visible light. Um, but the important thing is that you know that you have the higher energy gamma rays coming in from the patient and they are then converted into visible light and the visible light photons will then go into the next stage of the detector. This diagram shows the next stage of the detector, which is the photomultiplier tubes, or PMT. On the left-hand side, you have the visible photons from the scintillator coming into the uh, PMT. Um, and then this will go through and then produce an electrical signal at the end. So it's converting those visible light photons into uh, an electrical signal. Um, it does that by the visible photons hit the photocathode, which converts the photons into electrons. Those are electrons that are then accelerated through a voltage um, and they will come into contact with the dynode chain, so they're shown in red um, in the diagram. And each time they hit the dynode, the number of electrons will be multiplied and that magnifies the electrical signal that you're getting out at the end. And it's this signal that's then read by the electronics to create the image. So now that we've detected the photons, we need to use the positional information from the detector um, to be related into the image. So the detector is split into a 2D matrix and the detected events accumulate and are assigned to the correct pixel within that matrix and they are then summed to form the image. Um, and you can choose the matrix size to optimize for your study. So the more pixels you have, the better spatial resolution you will have because each pixel will be smaller in size, um, but you'll end up with a noisier image because you have fewer counts per pixel. So just some practical considerations if you want to achieve good images. Firstly, the more gamma rays you detect, um, so the more counts per second, the less noise you will get in your image. Um, this equates essentially to either longer scanning times or a higher activity injected into the patient. Um, you also need to consider that the closer to the patient or the source the detector is, the better the resolution you'll get because you'll have a smaller angle through which you will accept photons. Um, and you also need to consider that the imaging parameters themselves need to be optimised for different types of studies. Okay, so let's look at our first type of imaging, the mugger scan. The multi-gated acquisition or mugger scan is a type of planar imaging um, where we assess the left ventricle ejection fraction. So by planar, I essentially mean that the gamma camera is stationary during the acquisition of the scan over the patient. Um, in this case, the radiopharmaceutical that we inject labels the red blood cells, um, and this is an ECG-gated planar acquisition. So this table shows some typical scanning parameters for this type of scan. So you can see from the radiopharmaceutical that we're using technetium 99M for technotates. The technetium means that we need low-energy collimators. Um, as I said, the detector... Uh, position is in L mode, so those two detectors you saw around the patient are in an L shape um, and as close to the patient as, can to, as they can be to improve the spatial resolution. Um, and we use LEGP or general purpose collimators with quite a small matrix size, 64 by 64, um, and this is to improve our sensitivity because we are ECG gating our scan, so we need to get as many counts as we can um, as possible. 
um, and we scan the patient for about 10 minutes. So ECG gating is used so that we can image across the cardiac cycle. So we use our ECG signal to split the counts that we're recording, so that all the detected events that we're recording, into separate bins. So we divide the cardiac cycle into bins, and then the counts that are recorded within each of those time frames within the cardiac cycle are then assigned to the correct bins. And then for the next cardiac cycle, the same bins are assigned and all the counts are put into the correct bins. And that means we can accumulate the counts within the bins to produce an image across the 10 minutes. So we're averaging across the 10 minutes for each of those bins. So then to analyse the mugger scan, you can use software to find the border of the left ventricle across the cardiac cycle and calculate the ejection fraction using the counts at end diastole and at systole. Um, and then you can produce analysis like this that shows the, the counts across the, the cycle and calculate your ejection fraction. So now we're going to move on to 3D imaging. So we're going to look at SPECT imaging. To create 3D SPECT images, now the gamma camera rotates around the patient, acquiring data at different projections, so different angles around the patient. Um, so in this image, you can see the gamma camera rotating around that, the patient at center and recording an image at each of the different angles. Um, and at each angle, the data is stored in what's called a sinogram. So you can see the sinogram building up over the right hand side of the uh, slide there. Um, we can then use a mathematical algorithm to reconstruct a 3D image from that sinogram. Filter back projection is the simplest form of uh, image reconstruction. So as I said, projection images are taken at different acquires around your object. And in this case, the data is then back projected into the image space and summed to, to work out what the original object looked like. So in the diagram here, you have two sources uh, in the middle, which then have been imaged at three different angles. And you can see from those lines what you would see in each of those projections. Um, so for back projection in this case, you would then draw a straight line from your detector through imaging space for each of those projections. Um, and you can see that for those different angles, each of those projections overlap where the sources actually are. So if you image from enough different angles, you'll see enough of this overlap that you will see uh, more of your counts actually where the source is. Um, so you can see from this process that the data becomes blurred because you don't know where along that line uh, the source is. So you just have to blur the information across the whole image. Um, and you can reduce this blurring by filtering the projections. Um, this technique as assumes a very simple projection model um, and you can't account for non-uniform attenuation within the imaging space. So for instance, if you have something like bone, which is gonna absorb a lot of the photons, you can't account for that in your image. So you'll just see fewer uh, photons detected in that area. So another form of image reconstruction is iterative reconstruction. So in this case, we start with our sinogram, our original projections, um, and we also make an estimate of what we think the final image is going to look like. So here we just estimated a uniform gray image. You can then full project that estimate. So you get something, you get what would be detected if this were the true image. So this is what the detectors would really see and what your sinogram would look like. And you can compare your estimate of the projections with your actual projections for that image. Um, and then you back project that and use that to update your estimate of what you think the image looks like. So then for your new estimate of what the image looks like, you full project again to see what the detectors would pick up if that were the correct image. You then compare it again with what you actually detected, back project that, and then use that to update your estimate. And you keep on going through that process back projecting and updating your estimate until you go through and you find that there's no more change required and you have a reasonable estimate of what that image would actually look like for the projections that you measured. In myocardial perfusion imaging, the tracer is taken up into the myocardium in proportion to its blood flow. Um, and we use 3D SPECT imaging again with ECG gating to image across the cardiac cycle. So this study can be carried out 
um, both at stress and at rest for comparison and you can do that either as a one day protocol so do both of those scans on the same day or across two different days. Um, we're looking for higher resolution in these images so we use LEHR collimators with a larger matrix size so the uh, pixel size itself is smaller and here for the spec acquisition we do 60 projections at three degree steps between those projections um, and we require 30 seconds per projection. Once we've reconstructed our 3D spec data, we can then re-slice it into our different cardiac planes um, to look at the perfusion within the myocardium. Um, you can also analyze the data, find the boundaries, um, look at the um, perfusion and thickening within the walls, um, and you can look at the motion of the myocardium over the cardiac cycle as well. So now we're going to look at a different type of detector technology and we're going to look at semiconductor detectors. So some gamma cameras have replaced the scintillation detection system that we've gone through before completely in favour of semiconductor detectors. Um, so semiconductor detectors produce the electronic signal directly from that ga incoming gamma ray. So instead of going through the scintillator and then the photomultiplier tube, it's directly converting the gamma ray into an electronic signal. So this can offer benefits in performance and can also lead to more compact designs of the gamma camera itself. Um, and both of these advantages have been used to create some cardiac specific imaging systems. So as I said, the more compact design of the semiconductors allows for um, cardiac specific scanners. And one example of that is the D-spec scanner, which is shown here. So you have nine collimated CZT or semiconductor detectors which each rotate on their own axis. Um, and this leads to improved resolution and reduced scan time. Um, and you can see from the design, it fits neatly around the patient. Um, and there's increased patient comfort because they can see directly out. They're not trapped inside the scanner at all. Um, one downside of this scanner is that there's no attenuation correction available within it at the moment. So now let's move on to a different type of scanning, which is positron emission tomography or PET scanning. So the first thing that you'll notice about a PET camera compared to a gamma camera is that instead of having the head which rotates around the patient to create a 3D image, you now have a stationary ring of detectors that surround the patient during the scan. So going back to the beginning where we were learning about different types of radiation, um, in PET imaging, you're using isotopes that emit beta plus radiation, so they emit positrons instead of a single gamma ray. So this positron will interact with a nearby electron and produce two gamma rays. So these, the, it's these two gamma rays which are then detected within this detector ring that I was talking about before. So although the isotope is emitting a positron, what we're actually detecting is those two gamma rays which go in opposite directions from one another and are detected within the ring. So we have two photons which hit two different detectors within the ring and if they hit within a short pit time period of one another we call that a coincidence. Um, and then we can draw a line of response between those detectors because we know that the event occurred somewhere along that line. So when this line of response is correct, so the event really did happen along that line of response, then we call this a true event. And this is what we want to be detecting to build up our image. Now, you could also have two separate interactions at the same time. Um, and you could record the photons from those two separate events and draw an incorrect line of response between them. And we call this a random event. Um, you could also have a case where one of the photons scatters um, before being detected um, and again you would draw an incorrect line of response and this would be called a scattered event. So image reconstruction in PET is very similar to that which we talked about for SPECT. So this time instead of having projections from um, the different angles at which the head was, now you can build up your projections from those lines of response which line up and essentially it's like imaging from those different angles. Um, and then you can use that to create your 3D image through your reconstruction algorithm. Um, we also have another piece of information in PET, and that's the time of flight information. Um, so we know that we have a single line of response from a single event. 
um, where we have two detected events. Um, and if the source of the event is closer to one side of the detector than the other, then you'll record this photon before you'll record the other one. And the difference in time that you record those two events within the detectors will tell you something about where along that line of response um, the source of the photon was. Um, so that's shown in these pictures at the bottom. So in green, um, you can narrow down the region in which the event came from using what we call time of flight information. So the time difference between when you record those two events. So it's not precise enough to be able to prove the uh, resolution of the image, but it does give you a better idea of where that event came from. And you can feed that into your reconstruction algorithm to reduce the noise in your image. Moving on to the detectors of the PET camera. So as I said, these are arranged in a ring around the patient. So these photos just show a PET camera with the covers off. So you can see all of those uh, detector blocks arranged in a ring around the patient. So the detector block itself is an array of scintillation crystals, just like we talked about in the gamma camera. Um, so you will have different types of scintillator crystal because the energy of gamma rays you're detecting here is higher for PET imaging. Um, and each of those different crystals have different advantages or disadvantages associated with them. So whether they produce more uh, light, whether they are faster, um, and that those choices will depend on the um, kind of imaging that you're doing and will then influence uh, your image quality at the end. So again, after the scintillator, you have your photomultiplier tube to convert that visible light photon from the scintillator into your electrical signal. So in the same way that we talked about semiconductor detectors within the gamma camera, you can also use them within PET imaging as well. So in this case, we still have our scintillator crystal, um, but then attached you can either have the avalanche photodiode or APD, um, which amplifies the signal similar to the photomultiplier tube in our standard detector. Um, but it's actually more compact and it can be used in magnetic fields, um, which can be useful if you want to use this, for instance, in a PET. MR combined camera. Um, another design is instead of the APD you have a silicon photomultiplier. Um, so this is essentially an array of APDs which operate in a different mode um, and that means they can react faster and that means we can also do time of flight imaging with silicon photomultipliers which aren't possible with the APDs um, and they also produce a larger gain so you get a larger signal out of that. Um, so these are increasingly being used in PET scanners. So for myocardial perfusion imaging uh, within PET scanning, we use rubidium or rubidium chloride. And as we saw before, you get your 3D images, which you can uh, slice into the different cardiac planes um, and look at the uh, perfusion and the movement of the uh, heart muscle as well. So some advantages of doing rubidium imaging is that it's very quick. So within 30 minutes, you can do both your stress and your rest test, um, maybe 45 minutes if you combine that with the cardiac CT. Uh, it actually has a low patient dose because the rubidium itself has a very short half-life. It's a matter of seconds. So it actually disappears very quickly and doesn't hang around in the patient giving them a radiation dose. Um, and because PET scanners are generally combined with CT scanners, you can also perform attenuation correction and you can do some scatter modeling as well. Um, so you can try and get rid of those scattered events that we were talking about earlier. Um, there are some disadvantages in that it's very expensive. So you need to have a high demand de department to be able to justify bringing in the generator that generates the rubidium for you. Um, and the spatial resolution is slightly worse than spec. Um, and that's because in this case, when using rubidium, it has a large positron range. So that positron that's emitted by uh, the isotope travels a certain distance before annihilating with the electron and producing the photon. So that reduces your spatial resolution um, and the temporal resolution can be poor as well because it's noisier. So you have fewer gates when you're ECG gating. So I just mentioned that PET scanners are generally combined with CT scanners, which is known as hybrid imaging. So I just wanted to finish off by talking a little bit about different types of hybrid imaging which are available. So some examples of hybrid imaging scanners which are currently available include SPECT-CT, PET-CT 
and more recently PET MRI as well. So why would you want to combine your nuclear medicine, either PET or SPECT scan, uh, with a CT scanner? So one of the reasons is because the PET or SPECT scan will show you very well the functional information within the body, um, but it doesn't show you very much anatomical information, so you can't see where that uptake is. So if you combine it with a CT scan acquired at the same time, um, then you can overlay the functional information onto the anatomical information um, and combine them to make diagnosis easier. Another reason to combine your nuclear medicine scan with a CT scan um, is for attenuation correction. So CT is essentially a map of attenuation, so it shows you how photons are absorbed within the body. Um, so this can then be used to correct our PET or SPECT scan. So this is an example showing a phantom scan, so you can see what the phantom looks like on the right-hand side. So there's uniform uh, distribution of activity within the background, and then there are spheres that are split for, with activity. And if you scan this with no attenuation correction, as on the left-hand side, you can see that the background area, which should be the same intensity all the way across, um, is actually brighter in the middle and darker around the edges. Um, and that's because the counts that are coming from the middle of the phantom are being attenuated within the phantom, so you're getting uh, less gamma rays detected from those points. So if you then use the CT information to perform attenuation correction, you get the scan on the right-hand side, um, in which you can see that the background is now uniform, so you're actually seeing the correct distribution of the tracer. So your image reflects what you would see in the source itself. I also mentioned that you can combine an MRI scanner with your PET scanner. Um, so this allows you to combine different types of um, MRI scans with different anatomical uh, tissue weightings, or different functional images with your PET scan. Um, so you can acquire simultaneously both the MR data and the PET data. Um, and these can be combined in different ways. You can overlay the PET data onto the MR data. You could also use the MR data to do uh, motion correction. Um, and different ways to combine these different types of data is an active area of research at the moment. So in this talk, we've covered a uh, basic introduction to radioactivity. Uh, we've gone through how a gamma camera works and different types of planar and SPECT imaging. Uh, we've also talked about semiconductor detectors, uh, PET imaging, and finally hybrid imaging as well. So thank you for listening and thank you to all those that contributed to these slides as well. Please comment below if you have any questions. If you found that interesting, please like and subscribe for more lectures. If you'd like to know more, follow the BNCS on Twitter and visit our website. Thank you.